Mosaic is brought to you by these generous sponsors and underwriters. Learn how you can support Mosaic by visiting jewishpalmbeach.org. Good morning. I'm Barbara Kay, here with Susan Pertnoy. Welcome to Mosaic, Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County's weekly news magazine show. Mosaic explores Jewish topics here in the Palm Beaches and around the world. The daily headlines remind us that we all have to deal with threats no matter where we are, a fact amplified in the Jewish community. On today's episode, we'll explore those threats and how our local communities preparing We'll speak with counterterrorism and intelligence experts to get a better understanding of the threats facing the Jewish community. We'll be right back with Mosaic after this brief commercial break. Please consider supporting Mosaic's generous sponsors at Bruce Gendelman Insurance Services. Visit Gendelman.com today for your expert consultation. Live the way you want to live, in the luxury you deserve. At Morse Life's Tradition, choose a floor plan that suits your lifestyle and make it your own. Impeccable service and the gold standard in specialized signature health care. Live healthy. Live happy. At Tradition is where the living is easy, every day and in every way. Your home. Morse Life. Tradition. Interested in a different kind of Israel travel experience? Join dozens of local community members for a personalized journey through Israel during the country's 70th year of independence. Israel Your Way is Jewish Federation Community Mission to Israel in June 2018. Five immersive tracks will explore Israel's technology and innovation, arts and culture and cuisine, spirituality and religion, politics and security, and even a track for first-timers and families. Learn more and sign up while there's still space at IsraelYourWay.org. Joining us today are experts from the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. We have with us Matt, Matthew Levitt, the director of the Stein Program on Counterterrorism and Intelligence, Romer Wexler Fellow, Catherine Bauer, Blumenstein Katz Fellow, and Jay Solomon, Siegel Distinguished Visiting Fellow. Welcome to Mosaic. We're going to do something different today. Uh, security and terrorism is a very important topic abroad in, in our Jewish community and to our viewers. So in light of that, our viewers have submitted questions for you to answer. But before we get started, we'd like to learn about the Washington Institute and where you, and about your areas of expertise. So I'm going to start with you, Matt. Can you tell us about the Washington Institute? Sure. First of all, it's a real pleasure to be back on the show. Thanks so much. The Washington Institute is a nonpartisan educational uh, think tank, a 501c3, based in Washington, D.C., focused on U.S. policy towards the Middle East. And so we have multiple programs in different aspects of U.S. Middle East policy, many geographic, some thematic. I direct our program on counterterrorism and intelligence, and we have pro programs on Turkey and on Iran and on Iraq and on the military and on the peace process, Gulf and energy affairs, etc. And our goal is to uh, work with the administration of whatever political persuasion uh, to help formulate smart, informed uh, policy towards and about uh, the Middle East. Catherine, you want to expand on that? Sure. So, so I work with Matt and the counterterrorism program. Um, and uh, what we do is we, we write articles, uh, we provide congressional testimony, we travel to and from the region, um, often participating in conferences in the region. Um, I actually just returned from a trip with some of our trustees, including some of um, our, our key leadership uh, from the, the South Florida area. Uh, we went to Saudi Arabia, uh, Oman, and the UAE, and it was a fascinating time to be there. 
and a really incredible experience to, to meet with senior officials and learn about some of the dynamic reforms that are going on in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, to meet with Emirati officials and discuss some of their key security concerns, and to generally overall be there during uh, a time where the, the U.S. President made a statement recognizing Jerusalem as the is the capital of, of Israel how, how and, to, and to get their, their reactions. And um, I think generally the leaders in the Gulf that we met with um, saw this as perhaps not the best timing um, and, and thought that it opened a door for extremists to kind of manipulate the conversation uh, surrounding uh, pursuing a peace process or reinvigorating the peace process. Um, but it was not the top priority uh, in their conversations with us. They're very focused on countering extremism. They're very focused on the conflict in Yemen and containing Iranian influence in the region. And uh, frankly, the, the, the Jerusalem topic uh, didn't, didn't make it to the top of their agenda in our discussions. You came from the Treasury Department. How did you wind up at the uh, Institute? So actually, I, um, I worked at the Institute uh, previously before I joined government, it was my first job in Washington, D.C. I worked as a research assistant, which is one of the junior staff positions that we have at the organization. Um, and so it, the Institute was my introduction to, to Washington and a great perch from which to uh, begin to understand how the city works and how different parts of the city work, Capitol Hill, the administration, uh, the think tank world. Um, after that, I went to graduate school and then went to work in the, in the government for, for, for about 10 years. Um, so at the Treasury Department, I worked on countering illicit finance, counter-terrorist financing, and served as the, the U.S. Treasury representative, uh, both at the U.S. Consulate in Jerusalem, working with the Palestinian Authority, and then subsequently in, at the U.S. Embassy in Abu Dhabi, working with the GCC. Thank you. And Jay, tell me about your connection with the agency. Uh, well, I'm, an, I'm a bit of a newbie. I've only been there a few months, um, and I am... Right now, it's one of the things the, the Institute really likes to do is focus on specific kind of groundbreaking um, issues or themes uh, in the Middle East. So I'm working on a project now about North Korea's tentacles into the Middle East, how they've been a major supplier of missile systems um, to basically every country in the Middle East from Iran to Syria to, to Egypt. and. There was that famous case in 2007 when the, Iran, the North Koreans were building a reactor, in, a nuclear reactor in Syria that the Israelis had to blow up. Um, so basically the focus of what I'm doing right now is to try to get a sense with the North Koreans expanding this nuclear and missile ca capabilities, what are the, what's the likelihood of them transferring some of this stuff to, to the, Israel's enemies in the region. So that's, that's been the focus. And the last couple of years I wrote a book, a longer book on Iran and the conflict between the U.S. and Iran since 9-11. Since You're all such experts. Tell us, you're here in Palm Beach today for an event. Do you want to talk about it? I know you're the moderator, right, Jay? Yeah, we're doing a kind of a symposium looking at um, where we are in the, in the war against terrorism. You've had basically the collapse of ISIS uh, in recent months from their strongholds in Syria and Iraq and how that's a major victory in a lot of ways, but then looking at what comes next? Are they going to become more aggressive in, in essentially just doing uh, terrorist attacks without having a formal base in the Europe or the United States? And one thing at the Institute we've been looking at is as um, the Islamic State has kind of collapsed in Syria and Iraq, Iran and its allies have been trying to push to move to fill in this, this vacuum in these countries. And is that, what, what does that mean? Is that going to fuel a whole other round of, of sectarian violence? It's a high likelihood. And will they use this stronghold to position themselves on the Israeli border inside Syria and on the Israeli border in Lebanon? So that's what we're going to be talking about in the symposium. Don't give well, away everything. <laughs> You're dealing with fascinating and scary topics, but we now we're going to ask you about the, the we're going to ask the questions from our viewers, but we'll be right back after this brief message. Coming up, we'll go even deeper into the threats facing the Jewish community. Please consider supporting Mosaic sponsors at Lesser Lesser Landy and Smith. Visit lesserlawfirm.com to learn more.
Honor the legacy of Martin Luther King Jr. this year by creating a positive impact in your community with the Jewish Volunteer Center. On January 15th, you can join together with hundreds of people to lead high-impact volunteer projects around the Palm Beaches during the Jewish Volunteer Center's MLK Day of Service. You can see a full list of volunteer opportunities by visiting jewishpalmbeach.org forward slash MLK. We're back with our fellows from the Washington Institute and I'm going to ask a question from one of our viewers. What's the biggest security concern to Israel and the global Jewish community right now? And what are authorities doing about it? Who wants to start with that? Matt? Sure, I'll start. <laughs> it, it's hard to say what the number one thing is, both for Israel and the Jewish communities around the world. Um, these might, might not be the exact same thing. For Israel, without a doubt, the number one biggest security concern is Iran, both in terms of its nuclear program and their concerns that at whatever point the JCPOA, the Iran deal, expires or and or through whatever cheating might happen, Iran will eventually be able to pursue a nuclear weapon again. And secondarily, through conventional weapons and the use of proxies, Lebanese Hezbollah, the Iraqi Shia militias, militias that they've been building up now in Syria, that they will present a more immediate threat to Israel uh, from the north, um, as Jay said before, uh, across the border from Syria and the Golan, uh, directly across the border from Lebanon. About a week ago, one of the senior leaders of the uh, one of the most dangerous Iraqi Shia militias visited Lebanon, went just north of the border in Lebanon, but just feet away from the Israeli town of Metula, mm -hmm. and put it on Twitter uh, in a very clearly aggressive statement of, you know, we're coming here next. They're concerned about uh, Iran providing weapons to Hamas in the south, in the Gaza Strip. Um, and uh, all put all together, they're worried that uh, uh, in the event that Israel ever feels that it needs to hold Iran accountable, either for its sponsorship of terrorism or its ballistic missile production or its nuclear program, that Iran would be able to respond through these proxies. And we're talking about proxies in the case of Lebanese Hezbollah that have more rockets pointed at Israel, of course, more rockets than the vast majority of countries on planet Earth. Not all of them are long range, not all of them are guided or precision, uh, but some of them are, way too many of them are. And by virtue of having somewhere well over 120, 150,000, let's call them projectiles, they're able to overwhelm even Israel's three-tiered uh, missile defense system by just sheer numbers. So for Israel, it's not that they're not concerned about the Islamic State, they are, and they're very aggressive on this issue. In fact, you might have read, I would say, unfortunately, in the newspapers, about how some Israeli intelligence has helped thwart attacks in the West mm -hmm. that weren't against Israeli or Jewish interests, because that's how the Israeli intelligence community works. It's how our U.S. intelligence community works. We apparently helped thwart an attack in Russia, similarly. Uh, but when you get to the communities abroad, there's a, a, um, a much more immediate sense of threat from Islamic State as a terrorist group, uh, from the people who are inspired by it, many of whom uh, see Jewish targets as soft, easy targets. There's plenty of anti-Semitism and direction to target Jewish and Israeli targets within Islamic State propaganda. And that is a theme that we've seen over and over again. There was a case here in South Florida with an individual who was attempting to target a synagogue. So it's even close to home here. And then on the flip side, uh, Lebanese Hezbollah, which isn't trying to carry out attacks as often but certainly has a history, a proven track record of targeting uh, Jewish and Israeli interests both. And the last Hezbollah case that was thwarted was here in the Western Hemisphere, was in Peru. And the individual in that case secured Peruvian residency by engaging in a sham marriage with a dual Peruvian American woman who was splitting her time between Peru and Miami, Florida. And so FBI Miami had a case going on at the same time involving that too. So there are multiple types of threats facing the Jewish community around the world and very uh, specific Thank threats uh, facing Israel. Thank you, I think that was comprehensive. Uh, next, what is global terrorism increasing or decreasing and why? 
you can make me take this one too. So, so I'll start out. Um, so I think there have also there have actually been some studies recently that have said that global terrorism is is decreasing. Um, but I think our awareness of it is certainly uh, very high. Um, and and right now the concern and the risk uh, about homegrown violent extremism, the idea that um, in the past there were possibly more triggers for law enforcement uh, to see when someone was had been exposed to extremist ideology um, and between that and when they radicalized to some sort of to, to violence um, and that that's that's become more difficult because of social media people are being radicalized online um, there's there's some uh, there's some evidence that that there's there's usually some sort of direct contact that's not purely uh, just just on social media but but that definitely accelerates the process and makes it more difficult for law enforcement to see there's a lack of travel would have been one key flag in the past and so one of the things that we've worked on at the Institute, um, Matt and I and um, some others authored a report uh, last year on, with recommendations for, for the new administration on countering violent extremism. So while most of what we do focuses on U.S. foreign policy towards the Middle East, this was one kind of exception looking at some of the domestic programming and how, um, what role the government can play because uh, one of our conclusions is that you know the federal government is not necessarily best placed uh, to be to be working um, uh, at it, look at issues that occur on the community level, but there are roles that the federal government can play in terms of um, grants and uh, supporting best practices and, and things like that. And so it's it's one of the issues that that we're very focused on at the at the institute. And one other interesting point I think is and been in some ways kind of the mainstreaming of some of these terrorist groups. You had ISIS like controlling into ter territory and particularly in Hezbollah. You know, Hezbollah decade, two decades ago was kind of just very Lebanon focused. It, it was a militia that then ended up becoming a major part of the government. But now you see Hezbollah in Syria playing a major role as, a, as basically a, a, an army now. It's not a terrorist organization, it's an army now. And they're deployed in Iraq, uh, basically advising and helping some of the Shia militias there. They've been in Yemen, so they've, they've moved from being this a very Lebanon focus to being a regional sort of uh, sh shock troops for, for Iran in a lot of ways to project their power, to project their foreign policy. And they've also moved down into Latin America. There's been a lot of focus on their role in raising funds through illicit means like drug trafficking. So they've moved from just in the last two decades from a very kind of localized to a global um, movement that has real power across the Middle East now. Very frightening. We'll be back with more after this brief message. Please consider supporting Mosaic's generous sponsors at Bruce Gendelman Insurance Services. Visit Gendelman.com today for your expert consultation. Live the way you want to live, in the luxury you deserve. At Morse Life's Tradition, choose a floor plan that suits your lifestyle and make it your own. Impeccable service and the gold standard in specialized signature health care. Live healthy. Live happy. At Tradition is where the living is easy, every day and in every way. Your home. Morse Life. Tradition. Please consider supporting Mosaic sponsors at Lesser Lesser Landy and Smith. Visit lesserlawfirm.com to learn more. We're back with the Washington Institute for Near East Policy Fellows. And our next question is, what role has the media played in terrorism around the world? Look, it goes without saying that the terrorist group's ability to access media directly, whether it's Twitter or other social media platforms, has enabled it to expand its reach beyond all borders. And so you can upload something, you know, in a bunker in Iraq and suddenly people around the world have access to it. That's hugely important. But I think there's something even bigger, and that is the sense that because Western media feels the need to fill the 24-7 media cycle and feels the need to then populate their websites, 
they over report a whole lot of stuff. I think a lot of reason there's such a perception in the public that there's terrorism behind every corner, even though the evidence shows that incidents are down. Certain things like the Islamic State, it's huge, it's new. I'm not saying that we don't have big problems, we do. But this perception is largely created because the media puts it out there. I'll give you a recent example. After the Las Vegas shooting, which was not tied to international terrorism, the Islamic State claimed credit for it. A major, to go unnamed, a major uh, broadcaster uh, asked me to come on for something else and then said, hey, we're going to change it to this claim of responsibility for Las Vegas. And I said to them, Las Vegas, uh, the Islamic State has as much responsibility uh, claiming this as they do the recent hurricanes that were going on in the United States. Why would you give credence to this? And they said, well, if, if, they, if they didn't really do it, why would they claim it? And I said to them, because they know that you will cover it. And they are on their back heels facing military defeat in Iraq and Syria. And this enables them to have a major media outlet having a whole three, four minute discussion about whether or not they were tied to Las Vegas. They weren't, but we've had the conversation now, haven't we? So why does the media do this over and over? Why are they so, I don't want to say stupid, but why, why is this happening? From a... Um, business perspective, they're not stupid at all. Their job, increasingly, is not just to report the news, but to report news that will get you to watch. And which is why you're largely seeing this divergence within media, where they're, you know, people watch this set of television stations, True. or they watch that set of television stations, much like on social media. How many people follow on Twitter people they completely disagree with? We tend to, it's an echo chamber. We tend to listen to people that w agree with the positions we already have. That's happening now with television as well. And then that makes those television stations on all sides of the spectrum speak to their constituencies yeah. more because they want you to turn on the TV and to be watching them. So most shows aren't as informed and as balanced as this one. That's true. Thank there you, you for that. <laughs> Do you have confidence how the United States administration is confronting terrorism? I think what we've seen so far in the Trump administration is that uh, counterterrorism policy is not so different as it's been before. Um, and I think generally uh, counterterrorism policy is, is, a, is a fairly nonpartisan issue. Um, so I think, uh, you know, what, uh, what we've seen in terms of uh, continued efforts uh, overseas um, uh, using capabilities like drone strikes um, to, to target militants, um, things that we've seen possibly domestically, like the, on the topic of countering violent extremism. Uh, we have seen a little bit of a, of a rollback in uh, administration support for some of the initiatives that were put forward in the previous administration. Um, but, but generally, uh, it, we've seen a, a, fairly, uh, a fairly static approach more continuity than change. Well, the, I, the war on ISIS, I think, was really interesting because it, it was a land war in a lot of ways. It was a financial war in a, in a major way where there was, you know, a period in time where they basically were targeting all their oil shipments, their cash hoards in various parts of the country. So I think that, I do think over the last few decades we've learned a lot and the ISIS war combined, yeah, financial war, um, the internet and, and messaging and, and a conventional kind of airstrikes and, and a ground war. So I think in that sense, there has been evol evolution. I would, I would, I, I very much agree with Jay that I think the, the counter ISIS campaign is a real demonstration of how these various facets are brought together. I think one of the things that I'm seeing kind of emerging um, in the discussion of counterterrorism globally and um, that I heard a lot on this recent trip we took to the Gulf was, was a focus on the soft power side mm -hmm. Um, so, so we've, I've mentioned a number of times countering violent extremism, but it's something that counter extremism, it's something that I heard over and over again from our Gulf interlocutors. Um, and the idea that uh, in order to, to not only get rid of some of the, the vacuums that are exploited by Sunni extremists, but also that Iran has moved into in Syria, for example, as, as Jay mentioned, that there needs to be a focus on governance and on development um, and on moderation. And so I think that's, that's where I see the, the kind of discussion on counterterrorism evolving next. Yeah. You know, the only thing I'd add to that is this. The, the administration, like the previous administration, has a counter-ISIL Islamic State policy. We still don't have a Syria policy, right? 
And while Kate and some others were in the Gulf, I was in Australia and New Zealand, and then before that, several trips to Europe. And when I meet with our Western partners, the question I get all the time is, the Islamic State was a manifestation, grew out of what happened in Iraq and Syria. In order to maximize uh, our victory against the Islamic State in Iraq and our beginning of a victory against the Islamic State in Syria, though Syria itself is still a mess, what is the policy going to be moving forward? Do we have a Syria policy? And we don't. And we're going to need to do that. It's not divorced from counterterrorism, but counterterrorism is one small piece. It needs to be one small piece of a larger holistic policy. And as of now, we're not yet there. Now, perhaps this week the administration released its new national security strategy. It's 70 something pages, it's not a short document. Uh, it's very strategic in outlook, as you'd imagine it would be. The question is, do they leverage this now to put together a really well thought out policy on the issues that led to the creation of the Islamic State? Now that we've beat it back, how do we prevent it from rising again? How much um, <coughs> was the Institute involved in, tr in consultation for, for this? So uh, it's always good not to kiss and tell, <laughs> and also good not to take more credit than is due. But I have to say, every time I've gone in and out of government, I've come back to the Washington Institute, and I've had other opportunities to go elsewhere. And the, reason, the reasons are, are many, uh, wonderful people, but also we're able to have real impact. Um, because we're nonpartisan, uh, we're able to interface just as well with Democrats in Congress as we are with Republicans in Congress. I had one week uh, a couple of years ago where I spoke, uh, gave congressional testimony twice, called by the Republicans once and the Democrats the other time, and that's perfect. The same goes for the administration. So we've had the opportunity to interface plenty with the previous administration, and we've had the opportunity to interface plenty with the current administration. Uh, several of us were asked to come in and give briefings for the Trump transition team, uh, which we were happy to do. And if the Democrats had won, we would have been happy to do it for them too. Thank you. And we've run out of time. So thank you so much for being a part of this show, and thank you for joining us. Coming up, what's happening in your community? Want to see Israeli fashion icon Sharon Tal speak in person? Join me and other dedicated women in the community at Celebrating Women. This is Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County's flagship event for women in our community. Celebrating Women is on Monday, January 29th at 11.30 a.m. at the Hilton West Palm Beach. Interested? Learn more and RSVP today at jewishpalmbeach.org slash celebratingwomen. Mosaic is brought to you by these generous sponsors and underwriters. Learn how you can support Mosaic by visiting jewishpalmbeach.org.